Welcome to another episode of Silicon Minds Human Hearts. Today we'll be talking with David Bunyatan from Active Loop. Well, happy to have you here, David. How are you doing today? Good, good, good. How are you? Doing well. Happy uh, to be able to talk to you. Active Loop, what is it? Thanks for having us. Uh, super excited to be here. Um, so Active Loop, um, at Active Loop, we build a multimodal database to run to connect to AI models and run AI search or retrieval or train models on top of your own data. Okay. How did you get to start developing that? So before starting the company, I was doing a PhD at Princeton University dealing with really large amounts of data. And one of the issues that we had is processing this large volumetric images of a mouse brain was costing us millions of dollars on the cloud costs. And our goal was to reduce the cost by five times by rethinking how the data should be stored how it should be streamed from the storage to the computing machines, should we use CPUs, GPUs, and what kind of models to use. And all that like insights brought us to start the company about six years ago. Oh, so Active Loop is already founded six years ago. How have you been seeing the changes into the product linked to all the changes in the AI world? So actually in 2018, we were training LLMs for one of our customers. Um, they had 80 million text documents, all the patents. And they ask us if we can train or deploy them in, in several weeks. This was the early days of Transformers. So Transformers was just one year old and then Bert just got out. And we realized very quickly that these models are going to be having a lot of capabilities and impact on the world. But one of the challenges that we had is like, how can we get a lot of GPU and resources? And that's why we decided in that far future where the AI is going to be based on the large language models and they're going to be deployed everywhere, what is the missing piece? And at that time, there was no any AI specialized database or database specialized for AI. And we said, how about we go and take it? Because you had all these awesome databases, data warehouses, data lakes, now so-called lake houses that were specialized for analytical workloads, but you don't have one for AI workloads or unstructured data workloads. And I think we were trying to sell this database. Like, so what, what we did is like, okay, let's start. There's no one understands the database for AI. Well, how about we put it on open source? And then it very quickly grew up number two training across all GitHub repositories, number one Python languages. We built a community of 2,000 data scientists and data engineers. And then um, we, we were like going to these enterprises saying, hey, we're building a database for AI. How would you want one? And they were like, why do I need another database? And the things changed in a day after ChatGPT launch. Our downloads on open source increased 10 times <laughs> in a single day. And like people now realize, hey, we need a different type of a storage for handling all these vectors, images, video, audio, the documents, and so on. And that's where we started having a lot of um, growth and attention from the last two years. That must be a, a good day, <laughs> I can imagine. Yes, we were slightly early, but that was a good timing. That means you already had a vision of what is coming, especially if you were already starting with those LLMs, even before it was really known. So you, you never know it's a feature or it's a bug. That is very true. <laughs> <laughs> now, how can you compare Active Loop with other search databases? Well, traditionally you have Elastic, and people also use, for example, MongoDB or Postgres, all these various databases, but they have been focused on their own use cases like Elastic for logs, um, MongoDB for document and JSON files, and so on. And every major database now added vector search functionality, which is awesome. And it's like totally became commoditized. One of the things that we totally different is that we are built the database directly on top of an object storage where we can go and structure your data and then also index them where the index is directly living on top of the, let's say, blob storage or a data lake gen 2. And one of the advantages this gives is can be up to 10 times cheaper to store data and run the search on top while you pay off a slightly trade-off on the latency. So if you're fine to wait a bit a um, few seconds or an under a second instead of a millisecond, but you really want to go and process like billions of vectors, then Active Loop is like, Deep Lake is like a really strong solution for such a use case. And furthermore, what you double down on is the accuracy of the search. Now you can trade off this, um, like the storage efficiency gains to get more accuracy. And the way you do this is recently visual language models, um, they became so good at it that they overpass like the traditional pipelines like if you pass through an OCR pipeline and then you give the small text then to vectorize and store some vector database. 
you can run the search efficiently, but now you can, instead of going through this manually feature engineered pipelines, you can directly give the PDFs to visual language models. But then what the visual language models re return is not just a single vector, it's a bag of vectors, which is, which we call a tensor or an n-dimensional array. And DeepLake is natively supporting all these different data structures and then connecting them to the different types of the search so you can run that scale. So now you can go and trade off 10x cost efficiency with an accuracy gains thanks to this um, deep learning models. Okay. It's interesting how you explain how it works, but how is it used by your customers? Totally. So we have one of our customers who is searching across all scientific articles published in the world, including PubMed, which is about 40 million, and then you have also another big, much bigger data set, it's about 130 million documents. And one of the use cases is to be able to quickly run this so-called deep research on your private and public data to generate literature review that you can file, let's say, FDA compliant um, reports. Instead of taking the time to spend on six to eight months, now this time is reduced to three weeks. Or you want to do drug discovery to identify where are the certain gaps in the literature that's available that you can go and further explore, let's say, for new cancer types of drugs. And all this is like really enabled with multimodal storage because now you're no, lo no longer just like following the text information inside those scientific articles, but also embed the figures, images, tables, like the other like 90% of the complex data that hasn't been yet used by the intelligence to be able to enable the analyst or researchers to do better decision making every day. Okay, so it's not like what we see in many use cases of traditional rack where data is converted into markdown data and then given, you, you do way more than just text, it will be added. It's multimodal, so also the pictures will be converted and, uh, well, converted and, and it's analyzed. Yeah. Totally, it's very similar how cell driving cars work. Mm -hmm. So in cell drivings, you have perception part and you have the planning part. So for perception got much better when you got convolutional neural networks deployed onto the cars and you don't have to manually feature engineer every part. That was one of the big enablers in 2016 when the cell driving cars started get adoption. However, that was not the solution to the end-to-end -end problem. Then you had the planning stage and the planning is making the decision where the car, aside from like identifying here are the objects, where should we turn right or left when you are driving. And the planning initially was like a hand-ruled, people like wrote 300,000 of C++ code writing every condition whenever you see a stop sign and a person is passing, you have to stop and so on. And that didn't scale well. So recent models, they actually provide end-to-end -end neural networks for the planning stage as well. And now you have the perception and you have the planning and these are both neural networks, although the connection is not a neural network and you connect them as well end-to-end -end, and then do your training of your models. The recent the cars like Autopilot and Tesla is actually end-to-end -end neural network. And that's what's called software 2.0. And the same thing is happening in AI search. So now you, instead of having this manual markdown, pre-processing stage, multiple steps, perception, you give it to a visual language model. Instead of doing this agentic chain of thoughts, manually feature engineered iterations using large language models, now you have reasoning models like O3 Mini or DeepSeek R1. And then they do the iterations. And now that what we are doing is actually connecting this both with the storage in between that you can efficiently scale it at scale of the enterprise organization they will have their data on. Okay. You speak a lot about enterprise organizations. Can we make use of this database for SMEs? Yeah, totally. We have a lot of startups okay. using it, individuals. It's open source. Mm -hmm. You can go and start using it. You can actually contribute back to that as well. And furthermore, we have the free and community package that you can start using the managed version on your data to connect to it. Okay. I have one more last question to you that I like to ask to everyone. What particular AI service or tool do you, that does, makes really a big difference in your life and your day-to-day -day life? Well, I slightly hinted already, but the cell learning, I think that's one of the key things that's very, very helpful, especially the lazy parking mod where <laughs> you can just have fun on the phone while it's getting parked. I think it's done really, really well. The full end-to-end -end cell driving, I still there's a lot of edge cases need to be solved, but this is one of the first like real production usages of AI that's both is saving human lives 
And also, like you can see in daily, like at least in Silicon Valley bub bubble, you can see that every day. And I think it's going to have a big impact across all humanity by, um, I think, saving a lot of lives from the accidents and incidents that happen because of the cars. So you're saying you're a bat in parking? Yes, very fast. <laughs> well, David, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, looking forward to see more about the product that you're building with your team. And we wish you all the best. Thanks for having us. Thanks a lot. <laughs>